In the confines of the vertical self-management center, a grim, towering prison, Goreng awakens to the harsh reality of his concrete cell, marked only by the number 48. The stark simplicity of his surroundings, a bed, a sink, and an ominous hole in the floor, which his cellmate Trimagasi ominously refers to as the pit, paints a bleak picture of isolation. This pit is a conduit through which their only sustenance, a platform of food, descends daily, forging a cruel hierarchy based on one's assigned level in this vertical hell. Each cell mirroring their own houses two prisoners, all using pseudonyms assigned by the cold, unseen management. The rules are brutally simple. Eat what you can in two minutes before the platform descends to the next level. The lower the level, the scarcer the food, creating a vicious cycle of desperation and hunger. At month's end, prisoners are shuffled randomly to new levels, a psychological roulette that adds to the inmates' constant dread. When Goring first encounters the descending platform, laden with remnants of meals above, he is struck by a moral dilemma. He chooses not to eat, driven by a naive hope to leave food for those languishing below. In stark contrast, Trimagasi, seasoned and cynical, gorges himself, spitting on the food in a grim acknowledgement of the disdain likely shown by those above. Goreng's decision to save an apple for later backfearers, the cell becomes unbearably hot, a torturous enforcement of the rule against hoarding food. The apple, a symbol of Goreng's compassion, now becomes a threat to their survival, forcing him to discard it to escape the scorching punishment. This moment of crisis forces Goreng to reflect on the interview that led him here, where he naively signed away part of his life, lured by the promise of an accredited diploma. His only companion in this ordeal, a copy of Don Quixote, stands as a metaphor for his idealistic but futile battle against this inhuman system. Goreng's voluntary confinement, a trade of six months for a diploma, now seems a tragic miscalculation of the center's brutal reality. Trimagasi, meanwhile, reveals the absurd tragedy that led him to the whole, a whimsical purchase of a knife from a TV ad, followed by a fit of rage over a newer model, culminated in a bizarre accident where he inadvertently killed a passerby with his television. His story, a blend of impulsive consumerism and fatal misfortune, lands him in this cruel alternative to psychiatric confinement. Goreng learns from Trimagasi about the terrifying depths of their prison. Trimagasi, having experienced the despair of level 132, knows there are more flaws still, each descending into deeper starvation and madness. The haunting image of flaws stretching below, each a level of suffering, underscores the hopelessness pervading this vertical hell. After eight harrowing days, Trimagasi, driven by primal hunger, decides it's time to feed on Goreng. His pleas for mercy fall on deaf ears as Trimagasi coldly carves meat from Goreng's thigh. But as Trimagasi prepares to consume his flesh, Miharu appears on the platform. Remembering Goreng's earlier concern for her, she launches a fierce attack on Trimagasi with his own knife. In a brutal turn of events, she frees Goreng and hands him the knife, offering him a chance for vengeance. Overwhelmed by pain and shock, Goreng loses consciousness. Upon waking, Goreng finds himself back on the bed, his leg crudely bandaged with a bedsheet by Miharu. The grim reality sets in as he sees her consuming Trimagasi's body. Reluctantly, driven by survival, Goreng partakes in the macabre feast she offers. Miharu also provides him water before departing wordlessly on the platform. As time drags on, the decaying body of Trimagasi becomes a source of sustenance as worms infest the rotting flesh. Goreng, descending into a hallucinatory state, is haunted by Trimagasi's ghost, a spectral judge of his desperate actions. The end of the month brings again the narcotic haze, and Goreng dreams of a woman's presence, while Miharu's spectral figure watches. Awaking to the sensation of being licked, he faces a startling reality. His new cellmate is Imogwiri, the woman who interviewed him, accompanied by her dog, the item she chose to bring. They are now on level 33, a stark contrast to the depths below. Goreng recalls the unsettling pauses during his interview with Imogwiri, a prelude to the horror he now endures. In the present, Imogiri, now a fellow prisoner, confesses her ignorance of the lethal consequences of this system. She believes the prison has 200 levels and maintains a naive hope that if people only ate what they needed, there would be enough for all. Goreng finds her optimism ridiculous yet wonders if the sacrifice of a child could catalyze change, a notion Imogiri dismisses, confident in the company's policy against admitting minors. When the platform arrives with food, Imogiri practices her philosophy eating sparingly and caring for her dog. She begins rationing food, a small act of defiance against the inhumanity surrounding them. Imogiri attempts to instill a sense of solidarity among the prisoners. As the platform descends to the lower levels, she urges the inmates to accept the rations she prepared and to continue the cycle of rationing for those below. 
Her pleas, however, are met with cold indifference, a stark reminder of the brutal self-preservation governing this place. Goreng, disillusioned, points out the bitter truth. The administration has no interest in fostering solidarity, a realization that deepens the despair of their predicament. Imogwiri, clinging to her beliefs, is disheartened by Goreng's cynicism towards the administration, for which she once worked without witnessing its dark underbelly. Goreng, however, retorts that her past position afforded her privileges unknown to others, a privilege that now seems a distant echo in their grim reality. Despite continuous rejection, Imogwiri persists in her attempts to ration food, her voice a lone call for humanity in a void of hopelessness. It's not until Goreng, driven to exasperation, threatens to desecrate the food if the prisoners refuse to cooperate, that a grudging compliance begins to take shape. His drastic measure catalyzes a reluctant solidarity, a fragile chain of rationing forming amidst the bleakness. Amidst this tense atmosphere, the platform arrives bearing an unconscious Miharu. Goreng and Imogwiri tend to her, while the dog, seizing the moment, steals some food. The cell soon becomes unbearably cold, a punitive response to the broken rule against hoarding food, forcing Goreng to act swiftly to return the stolen morsel. The fragile peace shatters when Goreng discovers Miharu and Imogwiri in a deadly struggle, as Miharu had killed the dog for food. Her departure the next day leaves a chilling void, a reminder of the savage survival instincts that the prison invokes. Goreng shares Miharu's tragic quest with Imogwiri, who reveals a starkly different reality. Miharu was an actress who volunteered to enter the prison, alone and without family. This revelation is a harsh blow to the mythos that had built around Miharu, exposing the layers of desperation and delusion that permeate the prison. Imogwiri, facing her own demons, confesses her ignorance of the prison's true horrors and her battle with cancer. Her decision to volunteer, a last attempt to make a difference, now seems a futile gesture in a place devoid of change or compassion. Her despair deepens, rendering her unable to even rise from her bed. As their time on level 33 draws to a close, Goring implores Imogwiri to eat, aware of the uncertainty that awaits them. However, her spirit, crushed by the weight of her realizations and the relentless cruelty around them, refuses to respond. The next morning brings a new level of despair. Floor 2 Home 2, a revelation that the prison's depths far exceed what Imogwiri believed. This discovery leaves Goreng facing an even more harrowing reality, one that stretches beyond the limits of human endurance and hope. The grim revelation plunges Imogiri into despair. Overwhelmed by the inescapable depths of their predicament, she ends her life using her bedsheets, a final desperate act to escape the horrors around her. In this moment of tragedy, Goreng is haunted once more by the hallucinations of Trimagasi, joined now by Imogiri and her dog. These spectral figures, embodiments of his guilt and desperation, urge him towards a ghastly decision to consume Imogweri's body. Goreng, struggling against the incessant torment of these visions, seeks distraction. He consumes pages from his copy of Don Quixote, a symbolic act of ingesting his ideals and hopes, and uses a shard of a plate to mark the passing days on the wall. However, the relentless grip of hunger eventually overpowers him. Guided by Trimagasi's ghostly whispers, he begins the macabre act of feeding on Imogwiri. In the next shuffle, Goring finds himself on floor six, a significantly higher and more hopeful position. He is momentarily terrorized by a nightmare of Miharu attacking him, but awakens to find his actual new cellmate, Baharat, whose chosen item is a rope. Baharat's optimism, fueled by their proximity to the top, sparks a plan to escape. He asks for assistance from the couple on level five, who cruelly betray his trust, subjecting him to a degrading and demoralizing fall, his hopes dashed along with the lost rope. As they endure their new level, Goreng and Baharat are forced to witness the debauchery of the prisoners above, a stark reminder of the depravity that pervades the prison. The hallucinations of Trimagasi and Imogwiri persist, with Trimagasi tauntingly reminding Goreng of his nearing release and Imogwiri lamenting the futility of hoping for change. This bleak outlook, however, sparks a radical idea in Goreng. He proposes a daring plan to Baharat. They will ride the platform down armed with makeshift weapons and enforce rationing to ensure everyone gets food. Goreng's calculations, based on his time on floor 202, suggest that there are approximately 250 levels, a daunting but not impossible challenge. Embracing this plan, they fashion weapons from a broken bed, preparing to embark on a perilous journey down the pit, a descent not just through the physical layers of the prison, but through the depths of human despair and the faint hope of instigating change in a system designed to crush it. As Goreng and Baharat embark on their desperate mission aboard the descending platform, they arrive at level 7. Goreng insists they must not allow these prisoners who have eaten recently, and will likely eat again soon, to take any food. 
they resolved to start distributing rations only after reaching level 50, where the true deprivation begins. Biharat, initially hesitant because these prisoners were once his allies, understands Goring's logic when an older man reacts violently. This realization galvanizes him to join Goring in enforcing their plan, an uneasy journey through the prison's descending levels. As they continue, their task becomes more complex and morally challenging. At one point they encounter Bram Bang, a wise and respected elder. Baharat, deeply influenced by Bram Bang, listens as he acknowledges their noble effort. Bram Bang, however, cautions them that the administration lacks a conscience and may not notice their efforts. He suggests they need a symbol that the workers on level zero will recognize. Selecting a luxurious dish like panna cotta as their emblem, untouched and pristine becomes their statement of defiance and hope. Descending further, Goring and Baharat begin rationing food from level 50 onward. The prisoners' gratitude reinforces their resolve, casting a rare beam of humanity in the dark depths of the prison. On level 97 they encounter a morbid scene, a sick old man and a mentally disabled boy. The boy's chilling declaration of intending to kill the old man for food underscores the brutal reality of their environment. The journey continues, and Goreng realizes his miscalculation on the total number of floors when they come across a solitary corpse on one level. The platform moves past, indicating no living prisoners remain there, revealing the prison's even more extensive and horrific scale. The situation escalates violently when they reach a level where Miharu is being attacked by two men, one armed with a sword and the other imposingly large. Goreng and Baharat intervene facing a fierce and dangerous struggle. Baharat manages to subdue his opponent before assisting Goreng. Despite their efforts, they tragically discover Miharu has already succumbed to her injuries. Amidst the chaos and grief, Baharat pulls Goreng back onto the platform, preventing them from being left behind. They continue their descent, distributing food to the living and witnessing the macabre stillness of the deed. Their journey reaches its lowest and most difficult point at level 333, a number that ominously suggests it is the final floor of this hellish structure. Initially, the level appears deserted, but they soon discover a hidden presence, Mali, the elusive child whose existence has been a haunting narrative within the prison. As they step off the platform to approach her, it begins its descend without them, a sign that their journey has reached an end. Goreng, clinging to the idea of the panna cotta as their symbolic message of hope and defiance, urges Baharat to toss it into the abyss. However, Baharat, moved by the sight of the child, defies this plan. Instead, he offers the panna cotta to Mully, a gesture that is unexpectedly not met with the usual punitive extremes of heat or cold from the prison. As they remain on this final level, Goreng is continually tormented by the apparitions of Trimagasi, Imogiri and now Miharu, each a ghostly reminder of his journey and the choices he's made. Baharat comes to a profound realization. Mali herself is the message. This revelation, however, is soon overshadowed by tragedy as Goreng finds Baharat succumbing to his injuries. With Baharat gone, Goreng makes a crucial decision. He takes Mali with him onto the platform, descending into the unknown of floor zero. This abyssal level, shrouded in darkness and emptiness, represents the bottom of their despair, the finality of their journey. In this void, Trimagasi's hallucination reappears, instructing Goreng to leave the platform. Declaring that he is not part of the message, Goreng accepting this final directive steps off, leaving Mali alone on the platform. As it ascends, Goreng and the ghostly Trimagasi watch, a silent vigil filled with hope that Mali's presence will reveal the harsh truth of the prison to those above. This act, a desperate yet hopeful attempt to communicate the brutality and inhumanity of their situation, leaves Goreng in the darkness, a solitary figure who has traversed the depths of human suffering, despair, and fleeting glimpses of hope. The ascent of the platform with Mali as the unwitting messenger symbolizes a faint glimmer of hope that the truth might finally reach those who have the power to change the cruel reality of the vertical self-management center.